Welcome everybody to the, the hands-on session um, of the B2 Parallel Stream. And for this, we have Aaron Oliver Taylor from Gold Standard Phantoms, who's going to talk about, um, who's, who's going to have this hands-on tutorial about a digital reference object for ASL. So thanks very much, Aaron. Uh, over to you. Thank you, everybody. Um, so I'll just share my screen. So essentially, this, um, this session is going to comprise of a presentation, which uh, I'll just give for to the first 10 minutes. And then there'll be the chance for you all to have a go at the, the, um, the this um, notebook, which is basically a Jupyter notebook, which you can run in your browser and, and work through it and then ask questions and have you know some support if you, if you need. Um, and it can obviously be questions about the uh, the notebook or about the software in general or about digital reference objects in general. Um, so I have um, a conflict of interest to disclose, which is that I'm an employee and shareholder of Gold Standard Phantoms. But the actual digital reference object is, is not something we sell. It's, it's completely free. So it's kind of the conflict is not really to do with the subject here. So as I mentioned, I'm going to give a presentation to dis, just demonstrate, show what exactly this digital reference object software is and give an overview of the tutorial. Then there'll be an opportunity to have a hands-on work through the, the notebook. Um, and then uh, there'll be plenty of time for questions or assistance or discussion. So ASL DRO is some software, some generative software to use a term that was um, that was, that was coined in the in the previous session for for producing digital reference objects for R2 spin labeling. So, for those that do not know what R2 spin labeling is, I realize I should have included a slide, but um, I wanted to keep this bit brief. But basically, it's an MRI technique that endogenously can measure perfusion, and that is the delivery rate of arterial blood to an organ. And it does this by magnetically labeling the blood as it enters the organ, you wait some time, see where it goes and make an image. And there's a reduction in the magnetization um, that, that you have in your image. And by comparing uh, images that are sensitized to perfusion versus those that aren't and subtracting them then and fitting to a model, you can get, um, get, you can get your perfusion measurements. Now, ASL is a low SNR technique because the, the perfusion signal, I think it's about half a percent of the, of the total signal that you would see um, in, in your image. So you end up with um, quite long, um, well, you have to use single shot imaging. It's, we have to compensate for motion. There has to be quite a few averages. So there's, there's a lot of processing that has to be done to your images to kind of get them in a good state to be able to do this quantification and fit to the quantification models, even though the actual kind of essence of a perfusion uh, or getting a perfusion image is basically just subtracting your 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 sensitized your non sensitized your sensitized image with perfusion from your non sensitized image. So the non sensitized image is called the control image, and the label image obviously has the um, has the perfusion sensitization. So. The motivation for creating ASL DRO was because we wanted to be able to test image pipelines for processing ASL data with a known ground truth. And because the processing pipelines involve things like motion correction and partial volume correction, it was important to include features for this inside the digital reference object, as well as just having the perfusion signal. So essentially what we've made is some software it's built around Python. It's very highly modular. Um, it can be used more as like a general purpose um, DRO generator. And it outputs data in bids format, which is a brain imaging data um, structure. It's, it's kind of like nifty with some extra files that uh, tell you more about the data set. It's got metadata to do with the image um, files, to do with the image parameters, and then some additional things to do with the whole kind of data set it's, itself. So the software, this is kind of, I suppose, the engine 
um, which comprises a um, kind of inputs, which are your configuration parameters, your ground truth, which is essentially the, the quantitative parameters you need to generate your perfusion signal and your MRI signal. Then we have kind of a signal model module, which, which just generates your perfusion signal with this general kinetic model. We then insert that into some MRI contrast uh, images, apply motion, a motion model, um, add some noise. And it's important because it's a low NS SNR technique to kind of do this in a, in a realistic sense. So we add it to the real and the complex um, at real and the imaginary case-based channels. Um, and by doing it in this way, it means that for the low SNR kind of um, ASL images, your noise is Ricean. We construct a 4D time series and then we output all of that in bits format. Now, one of the things about ASL is that there are lots of different flavors from all the different vendors. So we've built this in such a way to be very flexible to all the different ways that the parameters and the, the, you know, the image volume orders and things like that can appear. So it's very configurable with the, the input um, parameter file. Um, so I think I've covered most of this, but one of the other important points is we've, we tried to make it so that we, we don't really have any reliance on any external modules. So there's a lot of, you know, basically wrappers for existing modules out there, such as, you know, basically using FSL, um, but it's something that's in Python or that kind of thing, which will do, allow you to do your an analysis. So we have actually implemented all of the methods um, ourselves within SLDR. So it gives you a kind of independent way of, of double checking everything. And then we've put in place a lot of tests to make sure that what we've done is, is correct. So the, on, the only question will be, are the models correct in the first place? And obviously that's something which is slightly outside the scope of some DRO software. It's more for the research, but that's, you know, the new models can be implemented. You can make comparisons. All these kinds of things can be done inside the software. Now, so the tutorial itself, is takes the place takes form of a um, a Jupyter notebook. So Jupyter notebook is an interactive Python environment that runs in your web browser. It basically comprises cells that have either plain text or they are um, code that can be run, and you run each cell at a time. So it's hosted on Google Collaboratory um, because. Of all the ways you can host these online, this seemed to be the most appropriate. It had, you know, the highest performance um, uh, sort of virtual service that that it'll run on. Um, so there was, and there was, there isn't a limit to the number of people that can use it. But unfortunately, it means you need a Google account to be able to run the notebook. So you'll need to log in. And the link for the notebook, it's in the chat. It's also here, and it's at the bottom of of, it, of each slide if you need to find it, use it. So essentially, um, the way that a Jupyter, the, the notebook will appear is you have this kind of page. You have um, on the left a um, kind of menu bar, which gives you access either to the files or to the parameters, to code snippets, or you can search things. Um, this is your runtime information and control. And then you actually see this, this notebook here, and you scroll down, and there'll be cells that you can run. Um, the, reason I'm pointing out a couple of these things is because uh, there is there are a few caveats to do with actually running it um, just because of the way I had to set up the notebook. Um, but essentially it's it's running kind of its own Linux environment. Um, there's you can run sort of um, shell commands like bash commands as well as uh, Python commands in here. But you don't actually need to do any coding to to um, to run the notebook all you have to do is click these uh, this little box on the left of each cell and that will run them when they run then they'll, most of them will output some text or images as a result and you can play around with say viewing the Im diff images in in different ways or to um, if you if you want you can go and edit the code change some of the parameters and run it again some of the later cells require variables that were created in the earlier cells so you do need to run it at least once in that order. Now, the, one of the caveats is that the, there is a setup cell, which is the first cell, which needs to be run first. And what this does is it actually sets up the kind of the virtual machine, the, the environment by installing a load of packages. 
because these aren't included as part of the standard Google runtime. Once they're installed, the actual runtime needs to be restarted. That's why there's this quit here. Now, Google Colab seems to think that it crashed for an unknown reason. That's not the case. It was intentional. But it does mean you need to restart the runtime manually. And that means clicking in this box up on the right and then clicking connect to a hosted runtime. And once you've done that, you'll see the files again. So if you don't see any files that says you, that says you need to connect to a runtime, then you need to do this. So generally, if you work through the tutorial, what you'll see is there's some information on, and examples of how to just run the DRO using the command line and examining what the format of the, the generated digital reference object data is in, looking at the parameters that you can use to configure the DRO, how you might go about creating a custom ground truth, using some built-in quantification fun functions and also kind of a, a sort of toy example of how you could use the DROD in your own research. So investigating the quantification models and the parameters and what happens if you use a different model to quantify compared to what you generated the data with or if you uh, change the, the assumed parameter values to something else. As I mentioned, you can edit the notebook, but if you want to save it, you need to um, basically copy it to your Google Drive because you can't save the, the version that I've shared. And that's just to go file and then save a copy in your drive. So good luck, everybody. Um, I guess we can answer any questions now if anybody has anything. Um, and if not, we'll probably wait a little bit of time so that everyone can have a go and then I can, I might demo working through the notebook um, if, if that's something that would be interesting to see. Thanks, Aaron. And if anybody does have any questions, you can either just turn on your microphone, turn on your camera if you're comfortable with that, or you can just post them in the chat as well. So thanks, Aaron. I'll just repost the link in case anybody who's just joining didn't receive it either. So it's definitely working for me. Um, 
I've managed to generate the ASL images and the, the Delta M and the, the T1 weighted images and CVF mark. Mine's still running, but uh, <laughs> should be nearly there. Yeah, it takes about a minute to to kind of run with the, the the default ground truth. So a bit later on, there's a there's a simplified ground truth that's created that is much faster to run. It only takes a few seconds, but it it doesn't look like a brain.
So everything's managed to work for me. Um, it's interesting that such a, what seems like a not too big a change in T1 uh, has quite a big impact on the, on the measurements as well. Yeah, so if and in the appendix, I've put, kind of put all the equations for the, the, the general kinetic model and essentially um, the T1 of the tissue appears in quite a few places. So it's quite nonlinear in terms of its effect. So it's the perfect kind of tool for, I, I suppose, putting in your exact sequence parameters and, and playing around with that because it's such a difficult problem. Yeah, you're right. It's really impressive as well. It must have taken a lot of time to put this together. Uh, yeah, we've been working on it for um, perhaps oh, about a year and a half. There hasn't been, I mean, last year, it was sort of about six months or so quite intensive, like full time, because we were trying to get to like the first reusable releases. And then this year, it's just been adding things as and when we've needed to put things in. So less, less this year, but still, um, yeah, quite a lot of work. I mean, as is the case with most, um, I suppose, test-driven de development, you, the actual code to do what you want it to do is relatively small part, and the, the larger part is the you know writing tests to show that what you intended it to do actually is what happens and catching exceptions and that sort of thing. So if you're running through the tutorials, please feel free to pop a message in the chat to say how it's going. If you're having any problems, if you've managed to get through and run the, run the different code blocks, um, just so we can see how everybody's doing. And so, Aaron, this is, um, as as Pete was saying, it's really very um, thorough and impressive. Actually, looking working through it, um, what do you think that this is kind of a mixture, I guess, of um, there's the DRO at the basis of it, and then you've got this Python, um, this uh, Jupyter notebook, which is then using it and showing how to generate um, signals and then fitting them and things like that. What what what's the sort of minimum description of a DRO. So what what is which which are the essential parts of a DRO uh, that you need without which it's not no longer a DRO? Um, well I suppose you could just have a, re a, re a def you know a data set, a reference data set um, that comprises some data that you know, looks like it could have been acquired on the MRI scanner. And when I say looks like, I mean, in the sense that it, it fits the, the structure and you, you've got the right sort of, um, you know, contrasts uh, are in there. So that if you fed that into some analysis software, it would then, you know, work for that. And then probably you would have some ground truth associated with that. So you could have a completely static data set um, for ASL, because there are so many different ways that you can have the data and you can acquire with different parameters. Um, I mean, there's, there's a white paper that now has the recommendation for how you should do ASL. And that's what you have on most of the MRI systems. Now, certainly the vendor products um, do that, but there are still some small differences. And there are certainly differences in the way that the data um, looks or is, is presented in terms of like where are the parameters what's the order of the of the control and label and m0 acquisitions and, and this sort of thing so i would say that the 
you know if you want to ha have some software that's that's relatively agnostic to what you throw at it to, to be able to test that you need to be able to um you know come up with all the different combinations and, and that, that you would have um find data in so that that's quite a lot so if instead you kind of modularize what you're doing so that you just test an individual part with the um you know with something that's the sort of what's the word so with something which where you have kind of have the intent of what that data should be so you know in this case we've got rather than starting with DICOMs, we've got nifties because most research level software is dealing with nifty so we're not dealing with the conversion there because uh, that's a whole kettle of fish in itself because actually converting from the DICOMs to the nifties for ASL is very difficult because most of the parameters that you want such as even just the label duration are they're, they're, they're not necessarily in the um, in the DICOM header or they're hidden you have to know where to find them so but if you break down that that step then you probably would have a DRO or set of test data just to demonstrate that you can convert everything correctly and then you have a you know a separate DRO to test this particular module and then to test this particular module but then at some point you're going to want to test the whole thing and so something which which does look like um you know data as it comes off the MRI scanner will start to be more useful then So I guess it really depends on um, what what's the intended use of it in the end. So that that's the that's yeah. the key thing for most Absol of these things, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the two use cases in the in the in this notebook is one where we generate the signal using the you know the full general kinetic model, and then there's one where we generate the signal using the simplified um, model. So if you if you use the the full general kinetic model to generate your signal and then you go and try and quantify it using this simplified model there's quite a large bias that's just because the model is making assumptions that are that don't always hold or they 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 get close but they still have quite a bit of a, a you know a, a, an offset at least to say and the reason for that is because there were so many different models that were used at the point that the you know this harmonization was done with this white paper it was you know deemed to be far better if everyone is using the same model even if it's a bit wrong than to have everybody reporting numbers that are calculated with different models so you know there if you want to test that your software is working correctly having this offset that's always present isn't very helpful so instead it's more useful to generate your signal using the simplified model because you know that the software you're testing is using that same model to to perform a quantification whereas if what you want to do is is have a look at you know what would my um patient cohort which who i know have these um you know differences in in their t1 of their gray matter or they have a different um, t1 in their blood or or something else or maybe there's you know they're particularly prone to motion for example so you could simulate all of that and then get a feel for what does what is what's the impact of that on on your study is it, is it going to be acceptable or is there going to be a, a large bias that you need to do something about so maybe in that case it says well we change how you quantify you include the adjusted parameters for t1 for example or maybe you know motion correction becomes far more important I guess one of the big advantages of modularizing in this way is that it's completely agnostic to, to different sites as well, because I'm sure, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure one, that's one of the biggest factors in doing any kind of multi-site ASL experiments is just the, uh, the range of, um, the range of different variability within the actual acquisitions and, um, even choices of coils and things like that are going to have a big impact on the on the 
the accuracy of your measurements. Mm -hmm. That's very true. It's, it's very hard to measure apples with apples or compare yeah. apples with apples, should I say, in ASL. So how do you see this fitting in with um, the, the kind of physical test objects that, that you develop for ASL as well? Um, so the, you know, physical test object is, is for testing the hardware, really. You know the that you're you're getting you, you you should be testing that what you're able, what you're acquiring is um you know either if we're going down the kind of just a qualitative qa route is that you are you're meeting some performance requirement so that you've got acceptable data quality or or you'd say that if this is calibrated if we don't do any um anything fancy and a lot of the things that are done in ASL are kind of fall into that camp, like the motion correction and registration, and you know, putting your data in from one you know space to a like you know to quite often the data is resampled to um, like MNI space that sort of thing, and all of these things are going to add extra um, you know extra biases. But if you just strip all of that back, so you have a phantom, it doesn't move, so you don't need to do motion correction. It it doesn't matter if it. Well, it can't drink coffee it can't go out to the pub it can't it can't have a bad night's sleep so its perfusion isn't going to change so that tells you is there something wrong with your mri system has that changed and but then the dro is there is there to check that your um your software is producing sensible results you know in the first instance is when we made this change for this thing did accidentally change has that got a knock-on effect for something else it's kind of part of just general software testing or someone's giving you some code and it does something um perhaps it's a slightly different algorithm or something you want to just run a test data set to see what the what the outcome is where you know what what it should be you know one of the ways would just be with a standard data set but a dro lets you you know have you have a ground truth so you can actually double check um exact you know is are you getting the right numbers how much is it off by maybe there's an advantage to using this new you know bit of code but if so if you're aware of what the bias is that that you know that's that's good the other areas would be if you have you know quite complicated um analyses you know registration being one of them that kind of could potentially fall over um if if the data that's coming in is is in a you know the quality is not very high or might have kind of some unexpected um, effects by using a dro you can really sort of probe and test for where does the where did you know where, where does the, the data well the results quality really sort of stop being sufficient and you can do that in a more systematic way than you would uh, with some acquired data you know you can it's reasonable to put somebody in the scanner and say, could you move your head around while we're scanning you? But that's kind of, it's it's quite subjective and it, it doesn't sort of tell you at what point is the degree of motion too much, for example. And you can and you can simulate other effects and you can, you know, re, re generate new, new data sets with different permutations or random, you know, combinations of parameters sort of ad nauseum. And the other thing as well that it's probably useful for um, a DRO, which far less so with the physical phantom is if, it, if you want to generate some training data for any kind of machine learning, um, so long as you have, you know, data that is, well, a, a process that let, lets you make data that's going to be good enough so that when you're training your, your algorithms with, um, you know, the something that looks close enough to, to the, the data that you then want to um, analyze with these um, these networks but then that would also be quite a um, a time efficient and probably um, you know cost saving way of generating these sorts of data sets because obviously acquiring lots and lots of data for training is um, is, is going to be very expensive and probably not always going to be easy to get through ethics depending on um, which what, you know what the general rules are in in, in your location So is it quite straightforward for people to 
develop other kinds of algorithms for, for the fitting as well? Yeah, so we've we've implemented a um, a pipe and filter architecture, which means that all of the kind of analysis parts have common interfaces, both for parameters that go in and or variables that go in, and then the outputs from your particular stage. And then you can pipe, you know, in, inputs into one filter from the outputs of another and you can chain all of these together and there's there's i mean there's a lot of filters in there if you look in the source code that um kind of give a good um, general you know set of examples for how to go about doing this for all number of different um processing steps you've got everything from you know where we just converting an image from um, a floating point number to, to integers uh, right through to the full, you know, calculating the general kinetic model um, for, you know, a, a combination of different parameters and then getting, making an image based on that. So there's, there's, there's lots of examples and, that, you know, that all sits within um, these pipelines so and there's there are a few you know we've got these um, I suppose utility functions like there there are a couple in the notebook so one of them is to um, create a ground truth and one of them is to do the quantification and those are all separate pipelines and they use the same kind of um, framework of these pipe and filters so to create something new uh, would be you know you need to get your head around exactly how things are done, but hopefully it's well documented enough to do that, but it would, it would certainly be possible. It would be very doable to, to implement another um, algorithm. We don't have velocity selective air cell at the moment in there. Likewise, you know, another um, related, it's not ASL, but it's measuring perfusion is would be for IVIM to have these signal models in there and to be able to generate um, the corresponding data. Um, because the you know the ground truth is probably has most of the things in there that you would need, so you know just it's just a, a, some some changes, and the other thing that's nice about the DRO is that all the kind of the the I suppose heavy lifting of dealing with parameters you know input dealing with um, outputting data in you know this bids format so it's in a in a standardized format that's all been done, so you don't have to reinvent all of those things which I think is I mean, it's it's not it's not that that's not really the interesting part. If you're doing research, what you want is probably to work on the models and have have a lot of these things there. So that's another advantage. And I, I guess it's also a big source of hidden vari variance that doesn't come across in publications. Doesn't don't, doesn't come across in in many forms. But you know, some of those kind of boring steps can cause quite significant errors. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that that's why we put such a great emphasis on making sure it's well tested and well documented. Oh, it's, a, it's a really fantastic resource, I think. Is there an, a, an accepted way of generating sort of image imperfect and perfections like, well, for example, motion artifacts, you know, you can, you can see that you could you could just apply rotations and translations somehow within your framework, but there'd probably be other subtler things going on with the data, um, which if you really wanted to make it useful for things like machine learning, where you're training with real world data, that you'd need to include those sorts of things. I was wondering if, if there's any, if you could plug something else into this, maybe that can help you with that. Yeah. Um, so at the moment, the one area of the DR, I'd say is, is it needs, it could do with, you know, making more realistic and, and is, is the kind of the signal formation and acquisition and, and especially with respect to motion, because at the moment we're simulating motion as rigid translations and rotations and the acquisition is just, you know, it's all just acquired at once. There's no, there's no real, um, that's not really how it happens in, in MRI, certainly not for the SL where it, you're using these, you know, um, fast imaging acquisition techniques like uh, EPI or 3D Grace, and typically they will be segmented. So if you have motion that's occurring across multiple acquisitions, these will be going in, you know, as part of different shots for the same, you know, these segmented images. So that, that those will be, you know, result in quite different artifacts to what's currently there in SL DRO. So that, there wasn't, I had a look into it, I couldn't find that there is a really standard, you know, 
tool to plug in if it, there might be that I'm not aware of and if anyone knows of, any, of anything that would be really good my thoughts were just to sort of simulate the k space trajectory and then you know do some sort of um non cartesian sampling in k space and then do a non uniform fft um sounds simpler i'm sure it'll be more tricky to <laughs> to implement um and it, it, you know these things tend to come with needs must because at the moment that wasn't something that was really needed but if there is somebody with an application and this seems like a, a good good reason to implement it then you know then it will get pushed higher at the priority list well we're coming towards the end of the allotted time Aaron so maybe is there anything that you well if there are any questions from our um, participants please do um, either speak up or or post in the chat um, otherwise Aaron would you is there anything you'd like to sort of say to summarize the session okay so um, I guess the session was just a an example of the digital reference object software SLDRO and how you can generate um, some digital reference objects for ASL. The software can do a lot more. So if you are interested in it, um, you can either drop me a line or um, I, put, I put a link to the GitHub discussions at the bottom of the notebook. Um, and also there, there's the documentation, which is, which is quite, there's quite a lot in there that explains how to do things. You know, we're very open to collaborating, very open to, um, you know, if, if people just want to say, well, I just want to take your software and fork it and, you know, modify it for however you want it you know to use it very happy with that and happy to you know it'd be great to know about that and great to um you know if, if you need any support as well so that's probably um most of what i have to say about that and so what's the the next big step for the for the dro you think i think it probably would be the um the acquisition to try and make that more realistic because the images do look a bit too perfect and that will that that doesn't have too much of an impact for just if you're looking at quantification but if you start to piece it together in the full pipeline of what's going on you know then where registration and partial volumes are based probably the, the largest sources of, of variation then more realistic acquisition is going to be very important there Great. Well, I think if we have no questions from our attendees, then I'd just like to say thanks very much, Aaron, for both a both a great session and a really excellent resource for the for the MR community.